you know, I, I was shocked to read how many restaurants uh, buy food from suppliers that are partially fried, and then the restaurant will fry it a second time before they serve it, like French fries and chicken nuggets and shrimp. So, and, and this and is the, happening at good restaurants, too, not just fast food places, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's, this is, you know, this is not just, by any means, just the fast food places. In, you know, as, in fact, you know, the, the plain old hamburger, you know, uh, three, four hundred calories, you know, if you compare it, I don't want to, you know, it's not that I want to give nutrition advice, but compared to some of these uh, salads that are there, um, you know, that are on the menu that's 13, 1400 calories, that hamburger starts looking pretty innocuous compared to some of the ways those salads um, are layered and loaded with fat on fat on sugar and fat. I mean, pick an appetizer, a modern American restaurant. I mean, pick buffalo wings. Mm -hmm. What are they? You take the fatty part of the chicken, you fry them first usually in the manufacturing plant, as you said. That loads 30, 40% fat into that wing. It pushes the water out. It's fried again in the kitchen of the restaurant. That's another 30, 40% fat added. That red sauce, what is it? It's fat and sugar. That white creamy sauce on the side is fat, sugar, and salt. What are we eating? Fat on fat on fat on sugar on fat on salt. Well, now you, I was also shocked to read in your book that you say that we think we're eating healthy when we order a grilled marinated chicken. But you say think again that a common way to get marinated into meat is through needle injection, and hundreds of needles are used to pierce the meat, tearing up the connective tissue, and they add salt, sugar, and fat. And but they're, they're loaded into the uh, into the meat itself, it's or they use these big cement mixers, and uh, and it gets absorbed in. Uh, to the meat, or they sometimes they use a needle uh, in, injection, and that's before the sauce is even put on the the chicken. And then it makes the food fall apart in your mouth, so you, you don't even so you eat really but fast because you, you don't really have to chew it. I mean, understand, you know, back in the 1940s and 50s, and there was a good part of this. You know, we moved toward processed foods. The advantages were longer shelf life. Uh, you know, the, the, the cheaper foods, wider distribution. And, and along the way, that processed food did what? The food industry learned how to dial in fat and sugar into that processed foods. But it also learned, when it made processed foods, was it took out anything objectionable in the food. So the food would go down, I mean, in a wash. The average bite, you know, 20, 30 years, the average bite we would chew 20, 30 times. Today, you just count, I mean, how quickly uh, the food goes down. I mean, how few chews you eat. Two, three chews, the, the food's gone, it, mm -hmm. it, uh, it disappears in the back of your throat, and then you just keep on doing it again and again, and you just, you know, it's a constant whoosh, uh, and what you're doing is really just sensory self-stimulation. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of consumer research the food industry is doing to ensure that we keep eating these kinds of foods? Because I found that fascinating. The, the, the food industry designs foods. It, it constructs foods. It manufactures food for that optimal bliss point. Now, they understand the inputs. They understand the sugar, fat, and salt stimuli. They understand the outputs that people will come back for more. They, know, they learned experientially. Right. I mean, what gives people the greatest satisfaction? They design food for that. And what we now know is that bliss point. I mean, I could show you on those brain scans how when people consume that or even just the anticipation of food, for millions of people, that uh, arouses you know, the, the physiology and activates those areas of the emotional brain, of the reward circuitry. And that circuitry stays activated as long as those cues are there. So for millions of Americans, I mean, they're getting cued, their brains are getting activated. And then when they start eating the food, what's interesting is their brains stay activated until all the food is gone, and this becomes conditioned and driven behavior. The average two-year-old in this country compensates for their eating. What do I mean? You give them more calories at lunch, they'll eat fewer calories later in the day. By the time that two-year-old is four or five, they lose the ability to compensate and because they're exposed to the modern American diet, fat, sugar, and salt, and it's as if their brain activity, right, just the eating for reward overwhelms the body's natural ability to regulate itself. Mm. Our kids are losing that ability to do that, and they're just constantly responding to the cues and food stimuli in their environment. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about some solutions. You say we need to approach this problem like we did tobacco, and we, we need to make a cognitive shift and change the way we look at food. So what do you suggest? Well, I think that's that's probably correct, the, the, the way you, you put it. I mean, how did we, you know, if you look at tobacco, I mean, it's probably the greatest public health success to date. What's What accounted for that success? Was it laws or regulations? No. We changed how we as a country viewed the product. We used to view it as something that was cool, that it was glamorous. Right? And what, what did we do? We changed, you know, uh, our perception of the cigarette. Now we view it for what it is, a deadly, disgusting product. And the problem is food has to be enjoyable. We can't, you know, we can't demonize food. But we can change how we look at these huge portions. We can change how we look at processed foods. We can look at, you know, food that is layered and loaded with fat on fat on sugar and fat and say, do I really want that? Is that really going to satiate me? Is there any real food, I mean, you know, in what's being put in front of me? I mean, do I know where that food is coming from? So I do think we can change how we look at food. And I think that is probably, you know, the, the, the greatest ask as well as the greatest hope. And what do you do for kids, though? Because as an adult, you know, we have that frontal lobe and we can sort of decide or think about this and understand the implications it has on our health. But when a kid, you know, wants to eat more and more and has, doesn't have that shut-off valve and is not compensating, what, what do you do then? Well, I think you've asked one of the hardest questions, and we don't know all the answers. Certainly children in their early years, parents have the greatest control right, in the first couple of years of life. And there, if what you have in your house and what you eat and what you're the role models are, I mean, are absolutely key. But, you know, even then you're vulnerable. Right? You, you, your kid goes to preschool, they go to mm -hmm. birthday parties, um, right. and if you try, if you just, the kid grows up and it's a sense, well, you know, I, of deprivation or, or only their friends can have stuff and, and they really want that other stuff, right? then deprivation only increases the reward value. So that doesn't work. So you're always walking this sort of tightrope. But, you know, early on, what you have in your house, what you eat, I mean, if you grow up in an environment where, I mean, you're eating real foods and, and fruits and, and vegetables, and that's part of the, the first several years of, of life through the age of four and five, that will stay with the child. But... You know, you add it. You start off in adding processed foods um, you know, heavily in the first couple of years. That also will stay with it. Right. A child. And once that brain circuitry gets laid down, I mean, if you have it in the house, right, or, or um, that child is constantly getting cued, right, they're, they're, you know, it, it's going to be very hard to interrupt those circuits. So what you have in your house, what you eat, uh, what you serve, um, but it, but. It, to be enjoyable. It can't be that you're depriving uh, children. It's just they have to develop the same kind of values that appreciate real food. Right. Now, I, I know that you pioneered food labeling, and I understand the FDA is considering now new food labeling to make it less confusing. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think the, you know, we worked hard in the 1990s to add the food label to all packaged foods. And the FDA is thinking about how to change that as is the Department of Agriculture. There's a lot of work going on thinking about what should be on the front of package. You know, we see these claims you know, boost immunity, but the package is, we saw that on cereals, uh, the company just took it off. You know, that right. just is, you know, is, is outrageous. I mean, there should be some information on the front of package like calories or fat and, uh, and, and sugar. The, the, the biggest change, though, I think, and probably the most important one, uh, will come uh, as part of health care reform in uh, both the House and Senate. I mean, there is legislation that does menu labeling at, at chain restaurants, and that can be transformational. I don't mm -hmm. know about you, but you know, when I pick up uh, a, a menu, I have no idea what's in most of the stuff that, I, that I'm ordering. And, I, you know, I just, in New York City, and, and I have to commend you know, the, the mayor and uh, the Department of Health, you, you know, it, not everybody's going to use it. But, you know, if, if that salad's going to have 1,500 calories and that sandwich is going to have 400, I at least want to know that information. So I think menu labeling in chain restaurants is going to probably be the biggest transformation in the next several years.
That's great. And then we have to get on to the, the, just the regular restaurants, not the chains, but those that are also buying those pre, pre-processed foods that, are, that they're refrying for us, which is kind of scary. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This has been so informative. Um, do you have any last tip for us to avoid overeating? You know, I think eating is very personal. Uh, it has to be uh, enjoyable. But I think in the end, um, where we're heading as a country, and we had obesity basically licked back in the 1950s and 1960s. Like the, we ate meals, we ate real food, um, and there were some boundaries. And I think moving back to some of the values toward real food, I think uh, maybe... Uh, as important uh, a part of the solution uh, as anything we've talked about.